The interactive media and the animation industry managed to blend together early on in gaming history. The advent of the Laserdisc format opened up new business opportunities for animation studios around the world. Among them was a team led by ex-Disney animator Don Bluth. After filing bankruptcy in 82, the pitch to help on an interactive adventure game was a welcome opportunity. Together with a large animation and art team, he created the visuals for the arcade hit Dragon's Lair. A number of Laserdisc anime would pop up in arcades around the same time, but their success was short-lived as the novelty of these interactive cartoons quickly ran out. The Walt Disney Studio faced different challenges altogether. With the lack of direction, talent had left the company, and the lackluster performance at the box office put the animation studio in further jeopardy. What followed in the mid-80s was a drastic shift in management. Roy E. Disney stepped up as chairman of the feature animation department to save his uncle's legacy. Their next feature, The Great Mouse Detective, was the first sign of the turning tide. Despite being made on a cut-down budget, the movie resonated with its target audience and boosted morale in the company. It marked the beginning of a successful director duo that would help create a new Disney renaissance with the many young, talented artists in the studio. The growing success of Disney features and afternoon cartoon shows put their properties in great demand. Video game developers went after their licenses to great success. Disney had a small software division focused on educational software. Their involvement in video games was limited to reviewing early builds, making sure they were up to their values. Meanwhile, in the home game market, pioneers had been experimenting with techniques to advance the animation in their games. For the production of Karateka, a process called rotoscoping was used. Its designer, Jordan Mechner, traced filmed footage to create smooth character motions. He would spend years further developing the process for Prince of Persia. He had to overcome some big obstacles since digitizing film in the 80s on a modest budget was far from straightforward. Despite these experiments, animation in video games quickly developed its own language, playing to the memory limitations and need for responsive actions using few frames and exaggerated poses to get the movement across in these low resolutions. While this generally worked well, dedicating more budget to animation could be a way to stand out in the crowded platforming market. An early example was Castle of Illusion. The rich source material and the new 16-bit hardware lent itself to upping the animation frames in the game. The lead artist on the project at Sega, Takashi Yuda, carefully studied the Mickey shorts. As a result, the animations in the game not only conveyed movement, but the personality of the character as well. With the 16-bit technology, game designers could further explore the boundaries of animation in their games using a variety of techniques. The time to call upon the talents of traditionally trained animators was nigh, although there were still some hurdles to overcome to bring their hand-drawn art into the digital video game domain. A key figure in this process was ex-Disney animator Bill Croyer. He was introduced to CG animation early on and experimented with ways of blending it with hand-drawn characters. His unique skill set and the feature work of Croyer Films earned him a reputation within the industry. Game developers Virgin and Activision got in touch with Croyer in the early 90s. Virgin Games was a company with aspirations in the animation field. In 1992, they worked on a game adaptation for the 7-Up mascot Cool Spot, featuring expressive sprite work. Subsequently, they had acquired the license for a Jungle Book video game adaptation. That same year, Clark Wilson, vice president of Virgin Games, came in contact with Andy Lucky, a man with many connections within Hollywood. Clark Wilson was demoed a process of digitizing hand-drawn animation at the post-production studio Metrolight and got introduced to Bill Croyer. Croyer had some downtime and was able to help Virgin experiment with a process of using hand-drawn animation for a video game project called Dino Blaze. During a meeting for Jungle Book, early tests were demoed to Disney software producer Patrick Gilmore, planting a seed for an important partnership between Virgin and Disney. Croyer himself would lend his talents to a completely different project, Pitfall the Mayan Adventure by Activision. Disney's feature animation had continued their rise to the top. Aladdin was a smash hit at the box office and became the highest grossing animated film up to that point. Sega and Capcom had maintained a successful relationship with Disney, and both companies picked up the hot license. While most of their Disney games were developed in Japan, Sega outsourced development for the feature licenses to the California-based company Blue Sky Software. They had quickly become one of the more prolific developers of Sega who had invested in the growth of the company. 
In 1993, they were entrusted two huge licensed projects, Aladdin and Jurassic Park. But having both titles in production simultaneously was a step too far. Jurassic Park had the highest priority, and thus Aladdin fell behind schedule, leaving the producer at Disney Software unsatisfied. The game was supposed to coincide with the VHS release of the movie that year. With four months left in the development schedule, Sega was forced to shift over development of the game to a different company. The perfect candidate for this challenge was Virgin, with their R&D for hand-drawn animation and excellent track record of dealing with tight deadlines for licensed games. After a briefing at the Sega offices in April of 1993, Virgin shifted into high gear to have a playable demo for the CES trade show in June. The team behind Global Gladiators and Cool Spot were assigned to the game and had to drop their Jungle Book project. The core game code and some gameplay ideas from this title were used to give the crew a kick start. They were used to handling this game genre and had worked together for several years now, resulting in a well-oiled production unit. Programmer David Perry led the project at Virgin. He was known as a fast coder and supportive to his fellow artists, always fighting to cram as much for their work in the game as possible. A team of four worked out the initial concept and game structure outlined in a design document. Their concept was to make a fast-paced platformer with a dose of humor and accessible to players of all skill levels. Their proposal was discussed with Disney Software, who gave their feedback and suggested ideas of their own. The Aladdin project also caught the attention of CEO Jeffrey Katzenberg, whose sponsorship of the project was key. To make full use of the R&D done by Virgin, the plan was to leverage the craftsmanship of Disney animators and assign them to the project. Disney being a very formal company, Katzenberg's support was key in making this a reality on a short-term basis. California had been the home of the Disney feature animation studio since the start. With their output and success on a rise, Disney opened up a second studio in Florida in 89, tasked with creating original shorts and having a supportive role in the feature films like Aladdin. In 1993, Disney feature animation Florida had just finished their third Roger Rabbit short and would ready themselves to help out on The Lion King. They also had a special projects unit that animated Disney characters for advertising purposes, so the Aladdin video game project naturally fell into their hands. Over 30 animators were enlisted to the Aladdin game, some of whom had actually contributed to the feature film. The Disney artists were tasked with creating modules of motion, short sequences that could be assigned to specific actions. Working on interactive media comes with its own set of rules. Mike Dietz from Virgin flew over to Florida and helped in this process. Apart from being a talented artist himself, he had a firm grasp on the technical side of production. Dietz carefully storyboarded the sequences, specified the number of frames, and provided technical notes to guide the Disney artists. For example, flipping character sprites in an animation loop is a common technique to save memory. Dietz had storyboarded his sequences with this concept in mind. Bringing a character to life up to the Disney standards is a laborious process involving dozens of artists spread over different divisions. For the video game, they held the same high standards. A key animator would interpret Mike Dietz's storyboards and suggest ideas from their own profession. They would start with a rough pencil test, which was discussed with the directors. Their work was subsequently handed to an assistant animator, who would flesh out the drawings and check each frame for consistency and dimensional volume. Artists in the cleanup department would trace each frame on a new sheet and make the final sharp outline. In tandem, seven effects animators were responsible for all the additional non-character-based animations including the smoke and special effects. In traditional animation, a layout drawing determines the location and size of characters per shot. For the video game, there was one dimension set from the start. All characters were drawn in the correct proportions to each other to avoid headaches further on down the pipeline. The animation frames by Disney Florida were scanned and inked digitally by artists inside Metrolite Studios, all according to the official color sheets. They passed image sequences in Targa file format to the art department at Virgin, who had to make the high-res files compatible with the Mega Drive hardware. A batch conversion process was the first step to convert the full-color images to palleted files. This would, however, introduce unwanted artifacts. The Virgin Art team had to touch up each frame pixel by pixel to create sharp and clean sprites. This was done in EA's industry standard tool Deluxe Paint Animation.
Taking the animations through the complete workflow was a time-consuming process, so characters were first tested inside the game engine in their rough pencil sketch form. Traditionally, characters in video games are animated with the memory limitations in mind, making sure they fit within the sprite boxes efficiently and reuse tiles whenever possible. With hand-drawn animations, each frame is different, and character poses could take on unusual shapes that were wildly different from each other. A solution to these problems came in the form of a tool called Chopper, programmed by the tool developer Andy Astor in cooperation with David Perry. A clever algorithm chopped each frame up into smaller squares as efficiently as possible, taking into account parts that were almost identical to existing frames and thus could be reused. The whole chain of techniques and processes was dubbed Digicel inside Virgin. Lead programmer David Perry came from a home computer background. Home computers greatly contributed to the rise of Western game development. Many young, aspiring artists and programmers had their start on these systems and found an audience through one of the numerous publishers. As opposed to the big Japanese developers who relied heavily on their own tools, Western studios were more keen on incorporating commercial software in their workflow, ranging from EA's popular deluxe paint and the music application Gems to a complete development environment that made cross-system development more efficient. Another tool in their arsenal was a program called the Universal Map Editor. A group of computer science graduates were responsible for this versatile level editor. It originally ran on the Amiga, but was ported to DOS at Virgin's request and used extensively inside the company. The team at Virgin had mastered these tools on their previous projects and were already well experienced at this point. The tight deadline of the project basically meant all hands on deck at Virgin. Artists throughout the company joined together in creating a sizable art department to process the hundreds of drawings and create all other assets for the game. Disney allowed Virgin to deviate from Aladdin's color sheet and slightly tweak the colors to fit the background art. In the levels with a cool color tint, the character's palette is slightly adjusted to better blend in with the other artwork. Virgin utilized their signature dithering technique of using vertical lines of pixels that would blend together under some circumstances. Working with a well-designed property like Aladdin had the upside of cutting down the visual development hours. Disney sent over background paintings and model sheets to the art team. They were great sources of reference, especially since they had no access to the feature film. All artwork by Disney, including every character drawing, was tracked and had to be returned to the company. In-house composer Tommy Tallarico was provided with the music sheets for the award-winning movie soundtrack. He hired Don Griffin to turn these sheets into MIDI files. Tallarico would take these files as a starting point and tweak the FM instruments meticulously to get the best results out of the Mega Drive. In addition, Tallarico also composed new music that would fit the dramatic tone of the lava levels. In two months, all the combined effort resulted in a fully playable demo build of the game right in time for CES. In a fully recreated Agrabah setting complete with performers, the top men at Sega, Virgin and Disney held their press conference. On the show floor, the game's fluid animations faithful to the movie caused a lot of buzz. Aladdin even managed to attract the attention of Nintendo representatives, setting important gears in motion. The following weeks, the game was further refined and tested extensively among its target audience. In contrast to the original plan of making it accessible to all skill levels, the final game would pose a decent challenge to even experienced players. Sega of America's QA team would meticulously test the game for all bugs and glitches. The final deliverables were sent to the factory early fall to ensure a worldwide release before the holiday season. The game's animation and Disney's direct involvement resulted in extensive coverage, not only in gaming press but mainstream media as well. Combined with a big marketing campaign, this helped to make it the best-selling game of the holiday season, ultimately shipping 4 million copies and thereby ending up as one of the top three most successful games for the platform. Aladdin was the result of various puzzle pieces falling into place at the right time. The successful merging of the animation industry with the video game industry had a big impact. It set new standards for the quality of animation in a video game. The success of Aladdin compelled Disney to start developing video games in-house. 
Inside their software division, there were already plans for a successor to Quackshot named Maui Mallard. This was a unique project and a rare exception to the company's guideline of basing all in-house software on existing IPs. John Fiorito, who had done the concept art for Aladdin, would head this project. Over at Virgin, it was a time of change as the company expanded. Programmer David Perry was in high demand and was asked to join Sega's Technical Institute, who were finishing up Sonic 3. Perry declined the offer and instead went for a deal with toy manufacturer Playmates. With the help of some of the Aladdin team members like Mike Dietz, he started the company Shiny Entertainment. Animation would be a leading factor in their workflow. Their first game, Earthworm Jim, was budgeted at $700,000. Instead of relying on an external animation studio and post-production facility, Shiny decided to keep the complete workflow in-house. Mike Dietz started out streamlining the whole workflow, taking into account what he'd learned on Aladdin. Early on, he did several experiments to see which pencil thickness and density would hold up the best throughout the pipeline. Instead of scanning the drawings, they opted for the method of using a black and white video camera to capture the images, giving them more freedom to experiment with settings and lenses while also speeding up the process. The artwork was digitized and colored in a software suite called AXA. Using the software, the artists would separate each color out into different layers before running them through the batch conversion process, all contributing to a cleaner result and reducing the touch-up work required by hand. All layers were composed into the final image in deluxe paint animation. Shiny was able to build upon the game engine used on their Virgin hits. It had actually been programmed by Perry before joining Virgin and licensing it to them. Shiny had an informal atmosphere. They didn't work with a strict design document, but relied on everyone's ideas to shape the levels. No idea seemed too outlandish. Thanks to this mindset, the game became a massive success, and thus a sequel would follow shortly after. Disney had been pleased with Aladdin and asked if Virgin was interested in acquiring the license for a game adaptation of their upcoming feature. The Lion King was still a year away from premiering and was initially viewed as a B project at Disney as their top talent had chosen to work on Pocahontas instead. So it was uncertain whether this movie would match the success of Aladdin. Nevertheless, Virgin didn't want to miss out on the offer. Both companies would work the details over regarding this multi-million dollar deal over the coming weeks. Virgin, now having exclusive publishing rights, handed development over to their subsidiary company, Westwood Studios. One of the co-founders, Lewis Castle, was actually hesitant to take on the project. He and his wife were expecting twins, and he'd planned to step down. Nevertheless, he attended the presentation at the Disney offices, where he was shown the first glimpse of the movie. The opening scene connected in a way that he couldn't decline the project. The Westwood team began the project in January of 1994, meaning they had twice the development time compared to Aladdin. However, they would face a number of different challenges altogether. A week after signing the deal, Lewis Castle found out that the Aladdin team had left Virgin, and he could no longer rely on their know-how. Westwood had to find their own way of fitting the animation frames into the game. Luckily, they could rely on their sophisticated compression algorithm and a larger ROM cartridge. The Super Nintendo and Mega Drive versions were developed alongside each other, using their cross-development tools and sharing all the core assets. Part of the licensing deal was to continue to make use of Disney's animation services. The talents at Disney's Florida studio were once again called upon to animate the animals. An animator puts a great deal of thought into the personality and states of his character, and lets that drive the motions. As a lion cub, Simba's motion cycles convey his youthfulness and nimble frame. For the second part of the game, they telegraphed the strength and weight of a full-grown lion in his movement. Disney software was more hands-on with production this time around, digitizing part of the assets. This process fell into the hands of the Maui Mallard team. They had to drop their current project and work on The Lion King for the remaining six months. The fact that the movie was still in production contributed to the struggle. Disney was very protective, and thus the dev team had to make do with limited storyboards and artwork for the initial four months. Two of the scenes that had been chosen by the developers to be turned into levels ended up being cut from the feature film. They'd already finished work on the levels and had to fight to keep them in the game. 
With so many parties involved in the project, discussion and conflicting interests were unavoidable. At the final hour, the game's difficulty curve was raised considerably per Disney Software's request, afraid that rentals would hurt the sales numbers. In the summer of 1994, the Lion King movie proved to be an unmatched success. Westwood completed work on the game and it arrived in stores while the movie was still in theaters. Thanks to the positive reviews and hype of the movie, Virgin shipped millions of copies, easily recouping their investment. For the remainder of the 16-bit era, Disney kept up high involvement in their game adaptations, making use of their animation studio whenever possible. The Disney Software Group, now renamed to Disney Interactive, could continue their Maui Mallard project. They contracted Creative Capers Entertainment to further develop their sketches, since the Florida studio already had its hands full. Creative Capers was a small studio formed by animators who had worked under Don Bluth on Dragon's Lair. The company had a close relationship with Disney and contributed to titles like Mickey Mania and Gargoyles. Disney feature animation Florida was about to start production on their first own feature film, Mulan. Some of the talent who worked on the Aladdin game would take key positions in this project. As the 16-bit era came to an end, unfortunately so too did the interest in incorporating hand-drawn animation in mainstream video games. Polygonal graphics dominated the landscape, and even its strongest supporters were starting to favor 3D gameplay. Disney Interactive restructured in 1997, ending their in-house production on video games. Nonetheless, the hand-drawn style had been one example of how the advancement of technology manifest itself in the 16-bit era ironically by incorporating one of the oldest forms of animation. It had allowed developers to leverage the craftsmanship of some of the top animators in the field, adding to the variety and flair of the 16-bit generation.